right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today uh, for this community call. Uh, we are joined by Ashley Farley from the Gates Foundation. Ashley has been with the Gates Foundation for uh, over nine years now and has been a real champion for uh, open science and, and open access to research um, at the foundation. Um, we are delighted that she's going to give us a talk today to talk about the new Gates Foundation open access policy. And uh, we will have lots of time for Q&A uh, after the talk. I have some prepared myself to sort of kick things off, um, but please do uh, enter questions as you think of them in the chat and I will um, monitor it and do my best to um, facilitate the conversation. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley now to go ahead and get started. Great, thank you so much for the opportunity to share today. Um, so I'm Ashley uh, Farley, Senior Officer at the Gates Foundation. Uh, like I said, I've been at the foundation for almost a, a decade working on the open access policy, but my background is in librarianship. So that's often the perspective that I bring to this work is really believing that knowledge should be a global good. Um, so what is open access? Just to cover kind of from the foundation's perspective, you know, what we think uh, open access is, how we define it, and how we think it can really help impact the research work that we do. Um, so it's the free immediate online availability of research articles. And really important is that we combine it with the uh, CC by license. So that's been the only license that's compliant with the Gates Foundation policy, uh, believing that there should be a wide range of reuse options of of research to further the impact of of what we what we fund. So where have we been? Here's kind of a high level overview on the Gates Open Access Policy milestone. So we started off. Uh, it's been an all grant agreement since 2015. Uh, at that point, is very much a you know if there was an open access option, we would pay it. Otherwise, those journals weren't considered compliant. Which was interesting at the time because most of the you know high prestigious journals or highly sought after titles uh, did not have an open access option at all, um, and so that kind of kicked off our decade long journey of thinking about you know career incentives and how that's tied to academic publishing and how certain um, grantees want to publish in certain journals in order to further their career and how that often can conflict with the goals of the open access policy. And then we launched Gates Open Research in 2016. That's one of my favorite projects to work on. It's a fully open post-publication peer-reviewed platform, which is uh, quite a mouthful, but I think really demonstrates how we could leverage technology to really change how we um, uh, disseminate research information. And, and it's a, a model that I'm surprised hasn't taken off more. I'll talk more about it later because I think it's a good example of what's uh, being talked more about in kind of a publish, review, and curate world. In 2018, we joined Coalition S, uh, which was, you know, a, which is a global movement of, of funders trying to line uh, uh, in open access policy, and that's important. And you know, collective action I think is a very uh, key component of being successful in the open access movement and in building open access policies. Um, so the idea is that you know we get kind of a more of a global movement, and that one helps researchers that have to comply with certain policies if there's policy alignment, but also you know in hopes of getting institutions and publishers to change policies uh, to align with with our own uh, that collective action is 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 key um so we officially launched plan s in, in 2021 which was not a great time to to change policy uh you know during a pandemic there was a lot of conflicting things going on um uh, but I do think it was a really interesting use case to see why, you know, a shift towards open access and open, you know, science, open research was really critical in finding uh, solutions and interventions during the pandemic. We saw a lot of publishers take down paywalls. Uh, we saw data move much more uh, quickly and, and smoothly throughout different research groups. We saw a lot more collaboration versus competitiveness. And I think that was really critical. And I think since then, we've kind of receded back to prior practices and attitudes in, in research, which I think, which is why I think it's really important for us as a funder to keep pushing for and advocating for change and change in policy to make sure that we um, continue to push for 
um, open access. Uh, also highlighting a few of the you know other points in this timeline, like UNESCO publishing uh, recommendations on open science as a global framework, the diamond open access movement that's really been taking off in the last few years. Um, one that is really important here in the U.S. is the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, so that uh, made a change to the public access uh, policy, which will, I believe, take effect either next year or the following year, which is something that I didn't think I'd see in my my career. So that's very exciting um, to see. And then we have our own policy change coming up. So here are some of the things that we've you know learned in a decade of open access. Uh, we've seen, you know, compliance had risen quickly, but then kind of flattened. We see that publishers are kind of slow to make change in their their policies or business models and definitely push back when revenue is threatened. Uh, we saw that it was really driven by the publishers. They see certain funding and they know that we'll cover article processing charges known as APCs or open access fees, that they would push the articles down that route versus it being really author driven and authors having choice in the um, mul multiple routes to open access that they could take. Uh, but we, yeah, we saw APCs kind of become the predominant business model. And other uh, models are slow to grow or gain adoption. Uh, we've seen community agreement that APCs have become inequitable with the largest or most expensive being $12,000 um, USD. Uh, but we've been having conversations within the research and funder community. Uh, what are different uh, publishing models that could become more equitable and sustainable and affordable for the community and kind of a publish, review, curate um, and talk about preprints and how that's connected. I won't talk too much about the open data component. Uh, we've always had a requirement, uh, but the compliance to having the underlying data be available has been quite low. And there are a lot of reasons, uh, mainly if, if the journals don't require it, then um, then it often doesn't happen. Um, and we've been trying to work a lot with our grantees to even improve the data availability statement so we know where the data may be, if it can't be openly shared, increase you know access to what's in repositories and better understanding what it takes to make sure that sensitive or private data is is shared in a, a protected managed way. Um, so lots of lots of opportunities for improvement there. And then always, you know, looking to work with similar funders to accelerate change. And I want to highlight too that we've done a lot of um, experimentation with business models, uh, especially in coordination with Coalition S. So uh, we launched the rights retention strategy and really upped our um, uh, routes through green open access, which I think was very important in that iteration of the policy. So the original was very much like you pay to have open access. And now we allowed other routes, whether or not those routes have been very successful, I think is still yet to be seen. And we've seen some barriers to implementing rights retention and always happy to talk uh, more about that. We supported the Transformative Journal program, which is sunsetting uh, this year. So we had been paying for hybrid journal publications, hybrid journals or journals that have subscription revenue for their paywall content, but also offer the chance to make articles open access, which creates another revenue stream. Um, so one of the cornerstones of, of uh, Plan S is really pushing for fully open access journals uh, to exist and not supporting hybrids anymore. But we did if they were looking to transform uh, into a fully open access journal, but that had it's not been a, an extremely successful program. We've not seen a lot of uh, journals flip, uh, I think, in general for the open access movement. So that is sunsetting. We've never supported transformative agreements, and I have a lot of my own personal opinions on how effective those have been, um, but they have led to a lot of open access content. Um, uh, and some funders do do continue to support them. We, we have not. Um, Yes. And then, yeah, we've done a lot of work around price transparency as well, trying to really understand. We know it costs to host a journal and to publish, uh, but it's often hard to, you know, understand kind of, I think, what might be considered the true cost of an of an article. There is some research out there, you know, that I think 
has has done a really great job of seeing the ranges, but there are also other models that have been very effective at at being uh, quite cost effective in in publishing. Uh, but when we work with a lot of the larger commercial publishers, uh, it's very hard to under understand um, kind of their pricing models and the costs that they incur through publishing and how we might make that um, more open access friendly. And I feel like. You know, there's like a little uptake a lot in in the projects that we've supported, like the journal comparison service, and often many concessions are made by the funders in order to get publishers to participate. And then often anti-competitive law continues to come up as being a barrier in being able to share uh, such data more openly. Um, and I know library libraries are doing a lot to really now push for uh, transparent pricing, which I think is really critical in this space. And then, of course, looking supporting other uh, models. I'm a huge fan of the subscribe to open community of practice and seeing kind of how that model has developed in just the last three three years. I think it's really exciting trying to think of how, you know, we can shift our support to that. Uh, also following the diamond uh, open access community and, you know, exploring other models and when uh, and when we can be aligned and support non non uh, profit publishers and some of the interesting lessons that we learned. I think there's an assumption that um, we paid yearly for all of our articles we made open access. Actually, it, uh, the request for the foundation to cover those articles has been trending downward. Uh, we actually cover about 43% of what is attributed to the foundation each year. So we see that there's other ways that uh, grantee authors have been achieving open access without the foundation uh, paying for that. Uh, but then we also see that we are spending the most to the tune of 6 million for the articles that we are, are paying. I just wanted to co co uh, cover a few things about peer review because that, of course, will come up in our our uh, discussion around our policy uh, change, and and I think it's something that we, as a community, and also when we're talking about preprints, need to talk more about. Um, and I think kind of what's lacking in the peer review uh, model, the way that it's conducted at most journals now. You know, we still have um, a lot of flawed research that continues to be published and then retracted. Uh, open peer review is still fairly nascent. Uh, peer reviews aren't portable between journals or publishers, and that leads to a lot of duplication work. Um, and, you know, every year more and more papers are being published, and I think it's becoming harder and harder uh, to keep up. And then it still continues then to slow down the overall publishing process. And um, if you're active on socials at all, you can see a lot of discussions where somebody's trying to get, you know, a paper published and or trying to get peer reviewers for a paper and editors are saying they're sending out 30 more requests. And, and I just think that that system's not going to be sustainable for long and um, there's little coordinated effort, I think, to change that. And I think the people impact on that uh, of of the system is uh, really important to talk about as well. So I think we're seeing a lot of peer reviewer fatigue. Um, there's little incentive to do peer review well. Publishers are the ones that benefit the most from the unpaid labor. Um, Often peer review requests, you know, want additional uh, experiments or tests or data to be collected, and that's unreasonable to address for that one paper. Uh, a lot of power imbalances can be protected by that lack of transparency. I think it often comes down to gatekeeping um, in, in the research community versus, you know, the integrity and soundness of the science itself. So we, we've we definitely ignited tangible change in scholarly publishing, but our journey towards equity knowledge remains unfinished. And as part of our mission to promote equity for all people around the world, we must work towards a more inclusive future and research dissemination. So this is where we're headed now. Uh, our vision is really to foster a publishing ecosystem that's equitable and actually in inclusive. Uh, and I love that our policy is really trying to inspire a cultural shift away from prestige uh, and privilege in publishing to one that champions equity and access above all. I think this is really important. And these are the steps that we're taking to get here. I would say this is probably not uh, a sustainable open access policy in the long term, but I think it's very important to make these changes to stop perpetuating what's currently um, uh, probably some non-intended non consequences of the current policy. So an over-reliance on APCs, for example, uh, and their rising costs and inequities in the system. 
So we are now changing kind of what version of the record we're requiring to be made open access, and that's going to be required by requiring posting a, a preprint. And that since a preprint, you know, those are servers are sustained by funders in the community. Um, there's no author facing fees. There's no reader fees. So that gave us a good opportunity to then uh, stop paying for um, publishing on APC or per article level. And then stopping those payments will free up our budget to be able to look at and support new open access uh, business models and infrastructure like the subscribed open, like the diamond um, and anything else that we might be able to develop from, from our work. So championing preprints, you know, preprints, as you may know, if you're part of this community, but the early versions of the research that are made typically accessible upon submission are really uh, truly author driven of when they uh, feel are ready to share with the broader community. Uh, yes, they have had yet to undergo kind of formal peer review process, but um, they allow for broad and early community feedback. Uh, they have that ability to bypass lengthy publishing timelines. Again, when the authors are ready to share, it can be shared uh, quite quickly. Um, and then they're posted and you know, accessed on preprint servers, the CC by license, which I think is important because we've had a lot of experience over the years with our rights retention policy and you know allowing for other versions and green open access. And we've seen often a lot of publisher overreach in, in what authors are actually allowed to do. Um, and having the preprint version of the CC by license means that that research will always be available in that format. And so that's you know one of the reasons why they matter, but also yeah, allowing researchers to share their work uh, openly and rapidly at no cost to them. We're starting to see researchers cite and build upon research more quickly. We're also seeing funders and institutions change policies so preprints can be cited uh, to show you know work being done. I think that's really important for early career researchers that don't have the time to wait for long publishing timelines. Um, and I think that's also really shifting the incentive system as well, uh, because for, for me, I think they provide the most equitable benefit to uh, the research community, and especially as you know, preprints are journal agnostic, the research can be evaluated on its own merit and not the title in which it's published. Um, Here's a couple. So we are also, you know, in making this policy change, been following kind of the preprint research and discourse for quite a few years now. Here's a few things that I think have been really interesting in the past year, year and a half. Um, and we'll share the slides afterwards and I have links to all the papers in here. But I think it's it's been important to see uh, kind of the shift in even the last five years of preprint uptake, uh, you know, the differences between a preprint and then it's a uh, journal published counterpart. Uh, you know, how um, preprints are being, you know, used and disseminated, uh, and then how, you know, research, uh, the culture of science and research funders are, are changing their opinion on it as well. And so um, this has made it so we've been able to move more confidently forward in our policy change. Um, so some of this, yeah, I think preprints will lead to kind of, we can now really imagine and build up more of a publish review and curate model, I'd say, it's getting easier to be able to publish the preprints and we have the technology and services there. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, open uh, preprint peer review and what that looks like. And we've uh, been lucky to be able to support uh, two, I think, great initiatives, the Rapid Reviews Infectious Diseases, which have been reviewing uh, Gates-funded preprints over the past year, and then uh, recently announced a grant to pre-review for community support. Uh, so I think they're doing an awesome job working with the community. And um, I think important, yeah, one, building up potential peer reviewers, um, but really making it more equitable, educating, interacting with preprints. And I think that's going a long way to socialize uh, the sharing of preprints. I think the curation piece is harder, and this is where we have the most work to do over the next couple of years. Um, you know, trying to see and get preprints indexed more so that are discoverable. Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion to be had around what does curate mean in, in this model, you know, what what uh, technologies we need for and how do we leverage um, expertise in communities. I think the one thing that, you know, while I, as more of a librarian perspective, kind of, you know, don't see the article format or journals really being the best revenue or best um, 
like container to share information moving forward. I do think uh, journals do a great job pulling a community of people and researchers together. And if we can somehow leverage that in more of a broader preprint publishing space, I think that will be very powerful, um, but something that I think is is still very early stages. So again, we have Gates Open Research. We've been running it since uh, 2016. So there's a lot of evidence of kind of what this, you know, preprint to publishing uh, model looks like. Uh, the difference in this model is that, uh, you know, if you submitted here, typically you wouldn't be able to submit elsewhere. Goes through fully open peer review and article revision. But now we've launched Fair Archive, which I kind of consider like a preprint uh, server on on top of Gates Open Research. So now we get the same benefit of the great technology to publish the preprint, but uh, grantees can make the choice to then go submit elsewhere as well. Um, uh, especially as we still, you know, haven't made much advancement in the career and cinema space. We understand for um, career advancement purposes, grantees may target a certain journal, but also um, this ties in with the curation piece, the readership. Readership is very important in reach and um, prestigious titles have a very big following. So it's really hard to compete in that in that space until we we either replicate that or find other ways to make sure the research reaches the intended audiences. Uh, but I'm excited about Verichive, and we went this route for a couple of reasons. Um, one, we have about 20 different ethics and integrity checks that kind of built on top of um, this system. So it's it can take maybe up to a week to publish a preprint. So a little longer than some of the other uh, servers, uh, preprint servers out there, which our grantees can choose those as well. This is just another option. Um, but it, yeah, we're trying to experiment and see like, how do we kind of create and maybe more robustly verified uh, preprint and what that looks like. Uh, it's also already tied in with our grants management system. So we're able to confirm uh, grant numbers, uh, which you know doesn't seem like it should be a big deal, but uh, the metadata around preprints um, and, and anything in general is you know always been a struggle for funders to be able to track their outputs well. Um, yeah. And, and we'll also accept any kind of article type and discipline. It's only available to Gates funded uh, researchers at the moment, but that was important for us to give our grantees uh, at least a very easy option to comply with the policy changes. And here's just quickly kind of what they look like. You can see, you know, some of them might go on to the whole Gates Open Research platform. Uh, so that's where you see like the waiting peer review. We'll see that they've you know, clearly not been peer reviewed or undergoing peer review. Uh, and then here's some of the high level checks and kind of categories of those checks um, that are being done on each preprint. And my my goal is that we end up in the next couple of years with a really robust amount of preprints um, that we can do some really research on the research. And I will stop there for questions. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Ashley. That was uh, really helpful to get the bird's eye view. Um, <clears throat> we've got a few questions in the chat. I'm going to ask just a clarifying question first from Melissa, um, who was asking for clarification about what, um, you mentioned $6 million spent, I believe. Oh, yes. APCs, yes. is that right? Yeah. So we, we pay, so we, uh, sorry, and I should actually put these numbers on a slide someday. Um, we publish on average, around 4,000 papers per year that tribute the Gates Foundation as the funder. We are asked uh, to pay for about 43% of those. Um, and then for that 43%, we spend about 6 million per year to make those open access. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Um, and I think there was a question also about the a chart of the checks and services for Verichive. So actually, I think you had a yes. slide about that, but I was wondering- Maybe you could say a little bit more about what those checks are, because I think that's one of the things that makes Verichive different than some of the other um, preprint services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then happy to share more resources on that. Um, uh, there is more detail that I should know better some of the technology that they're <laughs> using, but we partner with F1000 um, and they've been a great partner in the space and willing to try and experiment uh, with us. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it, it actually probably, you know, I, there's a, a link to the preprint in the slide that talks about some of the moderation and checks that preprints are doing. It's a really good preprint. 
And so I think we're doing a lot of the similar ones where you have plagiarism, um, starting to do more of image manipulation. Um, I think uh, even AI checks are becoming more popular. Um, there also is a lot of uh, manual checking happening as as well. So um, similar to other preprint servers where you have that kind of person moderation. Um, and then we're hoping to... We offer too that if they want it to be more of an open research preprint that we will help with the data sharing as well because that's important to the foundation but as mentioned underlying data is often a struggle to to share and often if it's happening at the publication point of publication um if the researchers don't have the data in a format that's ready to be shared it can be a lot of extra work to make that happen um Perfect. Okay. Yeah. And I think they're also working on some badging so you can see more of and really understand like kind of what checks are being done on each one. Yeah. Yeah. I personally think this is an area sort of ripe for uh, innovation in the preprint space more generally. This idea of kind of markers of trust or, or badging, that sort of thing is sort of starting to bubble up in a lot of different places. And I, I expect we'll see some more activity on this soon, but it's interesting to see the implementation um, at at Verichive. Yeah, and I'll I'll put. I could actually think I can just copy and put this in the chat. But other, I think also getting um, you know like conflict of interest statements and mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like that. So there now you can see the breakdown. Perfect. Yeah, we'll definitely share um, the slides along with the recording after after we're done. Um, so there was a question right at the top from Claire, who was asking about um, data availability, um, which so you were you were just speaking a little bit about data availability. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a good segue. Um, she writes, uh, you mentioned data availability is always is challenging to always achieve. Do you mandate this or will you in preprints or is this an area that you are working on achieving? Yeah, so we've we've kept the requirement. Um, for preprints, we thought it was really important to keep signaling the need to share underlying data, but understanding, I think that's another reason too that we've been developing Verichive, um, understanding that preprint servers aren't often, like they're not, they don't have the capabilities to really, you know, work with the researchers to share their underlying data. They don't have that requirement when posting on a preprint server. So we will continue to monitor and try to improve that. Kind of the first step that we've been aiming for is having more robust data availability statements, just trying to develop that skill and, and expectation with our grantees to develop from, you know, email the author for data, which we know is not effective, um, but we haven't quite gotten to the point where, you know, I would love to see us have kind of a model and like where we are very, like we don't technically have a data policy at the foundation. We have a global access clause, mm -hmm. um, but that often isn't clear to grantees of like, what data are we expecting to be shared? So we're building out and then piling data management plans. So I think if we made that a requirement and then actually work with the grantees to track that through the, the lifespan of the grant and, and always reinforcing the expectation that the data will be shared, whether, you know, openly it would be the ideal or in a managed data a sharing platform. We've had some good success recently working with Vivly for our clinical trial data, and it's been great to offer that up as a service and option for our grantees, and then having them link that back to the preprints is definitely the goal. So working on achieving a long journey there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I definitely, I think this is another area where it's sort of ripe for innovation, sort of connecting the preprints infrastructure with the data sharing infrastructure to, to sync the two things up better. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask one of my preceded questions and then we'll go back. It seems like there's quite a lot of questions in the chat. So we'll go back to, awesome. uh, to, um, attendee questions. Um, my question is, um, what is the rationale for changing policies around APCs? So like why target APCs as sort of the, the main, you know, um, focus of your action and also, is the foundation planning to cover any of these sorts of charges, or is there like kind of a blanket prohibition against APC charges? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think I think it's it's important for us to take a a strong stance in being the Gates Foundation 
Um, we're lucky to do so and we're lucky to pivot in our policy, I think, quite quickly. Um, and often you know, we have kind of a, a saying that we'll take risks others can't or won't. I think that's important. And for me, it's just especially over the last five years, um, just seeing the inequities in the APC mo model become further and further entrenched versus alleviated is really concerning. And um, so if we're going with, you know, a preprint model and we want to support other models as well, and I don't think we can do both at the same time. So our budget is being stressed by paying the APCs that we are covering. Uh, that doesn't give us any room to experiment with S2O or diamonds. Um, so I think it's an important shift in stance to take that, you know, I, I'm hoping will also really encourage the the community to do um, the same or really start pushing back and having more discussions around APCs, how they're not inequitable and how hard it is to um, make them more equitable at this point. Yeah, very good. Um, so there was a question in the chat also about uh, sort of following on from, from my question, which was uh, wondering whether you have any thoughts about um, PLOS's newly announced project to yeah. find an alternate business model. Yes, I think that's great. Actually, um, this is not, this hasn't been announced yet, but I'm going to share it anyways. Uh, we have just uh, signed a similar agreement with with PLOS that will allow our grantees to continue to publish there without paying APCs, um, while we also work to change alternative business models. Um, and I'm really glad to see that other funders are also looking at this and really pushing for it, because I think, again, that collective action is going to be uh, really important. I do think it's going to it's going to be really tough. Um, uh, this is really new, I think, especially for fully open access journals. You know, they've they have PLOS has done some work around certain journals with like the CAT program. And I think there's potential there, but we haven't seen anything as a really strong all alternative. So I'm hoping that funder groups and um, publishers like PLOS, we can work together to really find something that that works. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it plays into another question that I had, which was just sort of about the role of different stakeholders in the space. So I was thinking about how funders, universities, and individual researchers can work together to best accelerate research progress. Sort of wondering if you had any any ideas about sort of like, I don't know, different roles and responsibilities and so on of, of different um, actors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's been already a lot of great work in this space, but uh, change change can be hard and scary. And I think often the researchers are the ones that um, kind of get stuck in the middle of where funders really want to see change happen and, and lead those change through policies. And then between, you know, publishers and their requirements and wanting to publish in, in certain journals. I mean, I would... And I think one of the things I would love to see as a funder, I think one group we need to work more with is libraries, because uh, libraries have been doing a lot of great work in this space. They're also the you know the institutions and libraries are the other major payer into the system, along with funders, and we have very little I think connection. And I honestly think that many of the publishers really benefit from from that as we we all send the monies that way. Um, uh, I was really heartened to see the theme for Open Access Week, again, continue to be community over commercialization, and I would love to to see and work with more of the research community to really um, kind of live that and have them also want to live that community over commercialization and really kind of tune in and pay attention to uh, how publishing choices can really affect the the ecosystem. I think researchers have a lot more power than they think. And I think actually preprints are a great example of that because uh, researchers really fought for the ability to be able to to preprint and be able to share their research early. And I think that should carry through um, the rest of the change in the publishing ecosystem. Awesome. Um, okay, going back to nuts and bolts questions, um, will Verichive be included in PubMed and or PubMed Central? And... Also, can you clarify whether grantees can use other services like MedArchive? Yeah, yeah. So the great question. Uh, it is definitely our our hope um, that we will get Verikive indexed in PubMed. 
uh, it, it's going to be, I think, a long journey to achieve that. PubMed's been doing their pilot for the last couple of years for NIH-funded preprints, um, but have not scaled that further. And that comes in to a lot of discussions around, like, you know, how do we have a trusted uh, preprints? I think that's where maybe the checks will come into play there. Like, if we can demonstrate that this is what's been reviewed without, you know, the actual... Um, current construct of peer review, um, I think that'll help increase our chances of getting indexed. Uh, and and yes, grantees can choose um, any other server. We actually provide the ASAP BIOS um, recognized preprint database, preprint server database as, as a way for them to be able to choose. Uh, but we, to, you know, looking at our current footprint, and I saw there's a, uh, sorry to jump to another question saying, you know, we mentioned preprints are required, but on our website, they're encouraged. That's the current policy. Uh, our policy, our website will be refreshed and changed um, in the new year to reflect the new policy and they will be required. Um, oh, now I forgot the larger point that I was making there. Um, <laughs> That's okay. But yeah, but yeah, so, so um, we want, yeah, we went, oh, we only have our current footprint is, uh, of our published output is about 10%. So we you know preprint is still very new or just, you know, I'll be honest, when things are encouraged, they often don't happen. Uh, we do have some grantees that regularly use preprint servers, um, but for many, most of them, they do, they do not. So it's gonna be a really big shift for our grantees and their publishing practices, I think. And, and another reason that we have Bear Archive is to hopefully have that kind of comfortability in that, but also, yes, encouraging other preprint servers and want to meet grantees where they already are for preprinting. Yeah, I mean, with 4,000 papers a year, that actually could be pretty uh, substantial chunk in ter yes. terms of sort of influx into the preprinting system. So that will be... Um, very interesting to see the sort of downstream effects of of that level of sharing from the grantees. Exactly, exactly. And we, you know, we're already in conversations with a lot of the major preprint servers and acknowledge that, you know, when we think about supporting the cost of publishing and infrastructure, that also has to happen for preprints. And so now, yeah, we're having an uptick of that much. Like, what does that look like and how can we engage? So those are all, all uh, conversations that are happening now. Very good. Um, any reporting guidelines checking going on with the preprints? That was a question. Yes, oh. great question. So we uh, have a partnership with OA Works, uh, which is a nonprofit open sourced uh, organization. And we've built along with them OA Report. And so we are building into the current capabilities that we have uh, to be able to track our, our preprints. And we know this is going to be hard to start with. Uh, we're also looking at ways that we can you know, include this in our standard reporting that happens through our uh, grants management system. So knowing that a grant's coming to close, a preprint will most likely be coming at some point, reminding of the policy. But yeah, tracking through OA report. And then we are still, you know, we still kept the rights retention language uh, in our grant agreement and in the policy. Um, so we will still be, as we've been doing for the past few years, if we find a paywalled uh, article that cites foundation funding, uh, we write the author and request that they either upload it version to Zenodo uh, or, or PubMed Central, the author accepted manuscript, and that will fix the compliance issues. And that's actually been going fairly well. I mean, it's, it's you know, most authors really want to make sure that they have an open version and be able to share more broadly. Most are still new to even kind of the green open access or repository sharing and don't know their options there. Or some are quite hindered by journal policies, which is another reason that we've shifted to the preprint requirement. Very good. Um. I'm making my way through the questions now still. I th think we've covered a decent chunk. Let me see if I can find one that's um, new. So, okay, we've got a question about the connection between Verichive and Gates Open Research. Um, can you explain what the relationship is between the two platforms and how an article goes from one to the other or if it does? Yeah, yeah. So, um... Uh, Skate Open Research was always kind of built on the kind of you you published a, what would look like a preprint, but you couldn't publish it elsewhere. You went through the whole peer review process. That is still an option. So now with Bear Archive, you know, it is it is 
we have posted more like a traditional preprint. Uh, so the, then you can go publish anywhere else, or you can select to go through to the Gates Open Research Platform. Yeah. Um, and the submission system technology, it's all all kind of the same. So it flows pretty, pretty seamlessly. But um, I do think it's an important shift. Meanwhile, I really value the Gates Open Research and kind of the the you know f1000 model overall um there are many reasons that it's not getting the uptake in the research community i think it needs one of it of course being having no impact factor and so i think this was a way for us to you know still advocate for and market the model but understand um that grantees are still looking to publish the journal version of record elsewhere very good uh ludo i see your hand is up go ahead Yeah, hi Ashby. Um, hey, Lou, first how's of all, it going? it's really great to see what 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 you're doing at Gates. It's uh, it's uh, I would say uh, exemplary. Um, my question is about well, actually, the thing you just mentioned. So the career career system, um, including of course things like impact factors. So what you showed us in your presentation is basically all the things you're doing to kind of promote. Um, I would say more innovative, more progressive way of publishing. But then there's the, the other side, the reward system, the recognition system, and you didn't say a lot about that. So how you see the responsibility of Gates in that area? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, I would love personally to see, I think the foundation could take a much uh, bigger stance and movement in this. I will say um, that I, as a single person in the organization, are still socializing a lot of those concepts and ideas to program staff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we are a signatory of DORA. Uh, we signed the Barcelona Declaration. Uh, but getting, I think, more of the foundation and program staff involved in this topic is something that still needs a lot of work. Uh, but I do think, you know, the foundation uh, could do a lot more. But I think we, we are... Through the policy change, I hope we're signaling a lot that we're not willing to pay, you know, twelve thousand dollars to make a certain journal article open access that we know is only that expensive, really, because of the journal title and prestige that goes with it. And we understand the system. You know, we hope that you know the policy that we have now around preprints and that can run in parallel with what needs to happen for career advancement while we try to advocate and make for more changes. Um, we're involved in some groups, especially here in, in the U.S., but I I think we would need to do more with institutions. And I know I've seen people in the community say that instead of putting like the onus of open access or open research compliance on the individual PI or uh, researcher, that we should be doing that with the institutions. So only working with institutions that have signaled, you know, change in this space, which I think is kind of the only way to make change happen. Uh, but I think getting to that first step would be monumental. And um, yeah, I'm not sure how we get there, but I do think that it's something that funders uh, could really choose like who they they work with has to espouse those same policies and, and mission. And that's just not happening now. Hmm. That, that idea actually sounds indeed uh challenging to realize of course but also potentially extremely impactful yeah yeah perhaps i could i could actually in some sense turn around the whole thing um so i have a responsibility at my university uh, Leiden university to actually think about what we do from the institutional side uh, both in terms of kind of how we um, um encourage or expect uh, um, our, our our academic staff to publish, but also, of course, the, the recognition and reward mechanisms that we put in place. Um, um, yeah, I wonder, well, looking at the, the direction in which Gates is moving, I wonder what should happen on at the institutional side to kind of make sure we, we are aligned. Um, and you, for instance, mentioned like the, the, the transformative agreements on this year, you said you have a personal opinion. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And the transformative agreements are, for my university, are kind of the way in which we realize close to 100% open access, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but with mixed feelings, of course, about kind of the way we, we do this. So what's your take on kind of the responsibility that institutions should take, or perhaps that institution funders can take together? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, really spelling out in promotion review and tenure guidelines, what the expectations are around publishing and not, you know, calling out also, you must publish in science, now sell nature uh, to be considered would, would be would go a long way in in either requiring or at least encouraging and acknowledging preprints, which I don't think many institutions do now. But I know it's been a little while since some of the research has been done on on what they what they count. Um, I, yeah, and and around transformative agreements, I think they, they have achieved. A, but I think the next step is hopefully getting more for the institution as far as um you know the kind of the price transparency um the cost effectiveness I, transformative agreements haven't been i think they're kind of a temporary switch to something else and they they just haven't gotten to that something else yet um uh so my real critique of them is just that they've not been actually transformative and and that the institutions don't get a lot of leverage out of them other than it has been great at unlocking the articles so that shouldn't be overlooked yeah perfect thanks yeah there was a there was a question in the chat also about the role of uh institutions so that was a good uh, good synergy there we i think we covered that one um there's a question, an audience question about um, preservation and longevity um, for um, preprints at Verachive. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Oh yeah, I mean uh, that's a great question. I'm I'm I should know this, but I'm on hundred percent sure I need to go back to Verachive. I'm pretty sure that we uh, that they are tied in with you know like clocks and in the organizations and standard um, preservation um services or standards um yep. it would be be the the same um as gates open research is set up yeah i will just say you mentioned earlier we have the uh the preprint uh server database on the asap bio website mm -hmm. this is a good place for folks to go overall to learn about these kinds of the features you know that you might not oh, yeah. always think about when when considering the different services um Preservation is certainly an important one and maybe not one that immediately comes to the top mm -hmm. of mind for people um, when thinking about these things, but you want to choose a place to put your work that's going to be there for at least some reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, we, I've got a couple more questions here in the chat. I, if there's anyone else that wants to raise their hand as well, we probably have time for that. Um, Yes, I see also in the chat something about preservation and uh, a mailing list at Stanford. So you'll want to check that out. Nice. Um, let's see here. Going back down. Ah, yes. So Maria was asking where they can find the list of approved preprint archives. So that is that's on our website, and I will include it in the email um, when we when we set the follow up and the slides and so on. Um, okay. Well, I guess we have made it through the questions. So I've got I've got more um, of my own questions. Let's see if I can choose one that's a good one to close us out on. Um, yeah, okay. So if you could magically change one thing about research culture or incentives in the life sciences, what's the one thing that you would want to change and why? <laughs> I only get to pick one. Uh, you're, yeah, I you're, mean, yeah, what's the biggest I, bang for the buck is the question, I guess. Yeah, it would definitely <laughs> be, I think, the tie between publishing and career advancement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this might show my naivete of not being a researcher, but a librarian, but I've never understood, and some li librarians, I know the roles, you know, are tied to tenure, but, um, at least in my career, you know, I've never been judged based off of my publishing activity. Um, uh, and I can't understand why academia can't be more like any other sector of how, you know, you, you show and demonstrate your, your work and your experience, uh, in order to get hired, um, I would love to decouple that and just really focus on research being about, you know, sharing experiences, outputs, um, learnings, and having that all go into a system that was really interoperable um, that anyone can access would be would be the dream. Yeah, Ludo. 
yeah yeah building to some extent on this point um this of course also relates to the puzzle that you mentioned ashley of the cure the curate phase in public yeah, yeah um so what should curate actually be um and at the moment um of course what what gates is doing with the gates open research is the the, the model of, uh, of, of of peer review and then uh, uh, approval of, of an article or, or not as a the binary curate model mm -hmm. and um i wonder how you feel about other types of curation beyond uh, the binary model like this is the the, the elife um model because in some sense i have the feeling that the binary approach to curation is kind of making it quite uh, attractive to take shortcuts in how you do. Sure. Um, so, so how do you see that going beyond the binary thing? Yeah, I mean, I I think going beyond the like binary, I mean, like accept, accept, reject sort of, you know, yeah. Um, I think that's very important. Um, I find, yeah, I the curation part is... Yeah, like I said, like I think the least explored part, and we need to have more discussion on it. I have a feeling we're going to have to use, like, I know AI and like technologies, like, there's a lot to be unpacked there, but I do think at some point we're going to have to leverage a lot more of that just to be able to keep up with the volume of what's being published. And maybe, you know, we have more of like, I love following the movements around like slow publishing or, you know, what if there were policies where you're like, you got to publish one or two papers per year out of a research. I love those kind of thought experiments. Um, but at the same time as a librarian, like I'm like, I love information. I want like everything to be out there and mm -hmm. available. And like, can't we use technologies to be able to, you know, comb through and collate and question all that material? Because otherwise I, I still see persisted and especially a lot of the researchers I work with is they're still only reading articles from maybe five different journals. And that creates their kind of whole worldview. So I know there's a lot being missed and that isn't being read that's not being cited um that probably is really valuable useful information um and isn't being very curated well now so i think i think we're gonna have to really uh start leveraging technologies and of course those kind of technologies can only be used if things are open and openly licensed so that's kind of the first step yeah yeah, really good points. Um, definitely a lot of food for thought. I, I find thinking about different ways to manage curation to be a really interesting puzzle as well. Um, how how do you lift up um, the work that needs to be seen, not necessarily the work that's like the loudest or the flashiest yeah. or the, you know, all of those other things that you, you want to leave out of the process, but um, make it fair, make it equitable. I think it's a really hard puzzle because in some sense, curating means separating Making or judgments. Yeah. yeah. And so it's really, it's challenging. Yeah. And I don't want to understate to the importance <clears throat> of people in the process either. Like I would love to see more platforms where people can just share their own, own work and, and get it highlighted more or be like, this paper was really cool and interesting and helped inform something or made me think something differently. And we just, besides still using social media, I don't, I, we don't really have a way to do that. Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Yes, um, thank we'll you. share out the resources afterwards. And um, I uh, I failed to mention it at the top, but it, it's kind of a, a strange day for us today in the U.S. So I appreciate <laughs> the, uh, the opportunity to escape from uh, reality for a little bit and hear a little bit more about the, uh, the exciting developments at the Gates Foundation. So um, yes, focusing on what we can change <laughs> in the meantime. And thank exactly. you guys so much for the great questions. I really appreciate it.